LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. A couple of years ago, I had Abby Wambach on the show. Abby had just finished this great book of business advice for women. And as I read it, I thought, well, this is great advice, but not just for women, for anyone. (laughs) Yeah, she told me. But she pointed out, look, most all business advice for all of time was written implicitly for white men. And sure, maybe other people could glean something from it that applied to them. Abby, when she was marketing her book, she was just flipping the script. With that in mind, I want to introduce you to today's guests, Mita Malik and Dee Marshall. Mita is currently the head of inclusion, equity, and impact for Carta, and Dee's a Wall Street alum turned career expert and coach. Together, they're the hosts of Brown Table Talk. It's a career advice show for women of color and allies. And I invite you to think of today's episode as Career Counseling 101. Here's Mita. There's been too often in my career where I have been told you're killing it, keep doing what you're doing, and then it's time for the promotion. And in many companies, it's like the six month or the year mark. They might promote people at a certain time. And it's like, oh, well, you're not ready. Right. But no one wanted to tell you that along the way. So I think to, to me, it's become coded language. When I hear someone say to me, keep doing what you're doing or you're killing it, I start to think, OK, this person is either scared to give me feedback. They're overwhelmed they just don't want to. And so, and I think about myself as a manager leading a team. Yeah. And if I give that feedback to someone, that's lazy on my end because I, I'm just saying that just because I don't have time or I haven't really thought critically ahead of the conversation. And so one of the things that I've thought about throughout my career and Dee and I've talked about is get other people who can give you feedback. The boss's peers, your peers, someone else who's watching you in meetings, who has influence and power, start to build your own self-awareness, right? I hate video. I'm getting better at it. But watching myself on video, being like, what are the things that I'm doing that's working, what's not? And I think back to Dee's point about being very specific on questions. So if I'm in a meeting, I've just presented to the board and I walk out and I ask my manager, how did I do? And he says, it was great. Keep doing what you're doing. But then I say, well, when the CEO asked me that question, what did, what did you think of my response? And if he still says, that's fine, that's fine. And if I have doubt, there were other people in that room. I should reach out and ask them. That's a great point. It leads to something that actually I thought of when I was listening to your conversation about this that you all didn't address in the episode, but that, I, that has come up for me. I'm going to use an example. I have one colleague who is asking me for feedback constantly. How did that go? How did that go? And after a while, I began to perceive this person as underconfident. Like Mm. they're incredibly skilled. Like they will go far. I'm sure they will be my boss in the future. And yet I'm like, well, what's wrong here? Is there a time when asking in that way can work against you? Or is is what I'm feeling actually fairly unusual? So you are absolutely right. Asking in that way is not useful. It's not valuable. In some ways, it even indicates your level of maturity as a professional, Mm -hmm. a better way to ask for feedback as you go um, is on specific projects, you know, asking questions about impact, asking questions about what do you think worked? What did, what did we, right? What did we do well? Um, where do you think we as a team, where did we miss the mark? And then asking the question and then, you know, what do you think, what do you think I could have done differently? That's a very casual, but more mature conversation because you're having two conversations. You are now showing up as a leader because you're asking collectively about the team. Well, I couldn't agree with you more because I think what you're saying is like, feedback is a gift. And if if I take the time to give you feedback. I've taken my time to give it, to like give and receive. And we're also busy, like thinking about those career defining moments when you need feedback, right? And showing up prepared for a touch base or the 360 or the annual performance, or like you said, the really big project or initiative. Because if you keep asking people for feedback over and over and over again, I think it's the lack of confidence and the work you have to potentially do with yourself. But also it's like it can be exhausting. I want to also add to this um, before we move on. Another way to be much more strategic in getting feedback is to ask on the front end and talk about critical success factors of the project or the initiative so Mm -hmm. that you're really clear going in 
right? If there's a big project, a big initiative, a big push for Q1, Q2, in the planning meetings, okay, just for, as a matter of clarity, Jesse, Mita, there are 32,000 things we need to do with this project. But, you know, guys, ladies, what are the top seven things we must get right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Love that. So clarifying uh, critical success factors, right? What is it that we must hit? But do you see how this conversation of getting feedback, Mm -hmm. it's much broader. There's levels to this, levels. So I want to talk for a second about the difference between mentors and sponsors, which I Mm -hmm. think the Hello Monday audience grocks at this point. We get it. But heck, we got a lot of mentors. We need more sponsors. You have some proactive ideas about how we convert mentors to sponsors. Y'all want to take that one? I keep saying I am over-mentored and under-sponsored. That's been my entire career. And I actually posted something about on this on LinkedIn and got a lot of conversation, a little bit of flack. Well, mentors are just as important. Mentors can help you get ahead. And here's the deal. I consider Jesse to be an ally for us, an ally for this podcast. She's also a mentor. But Jesse is not a sponsor. Jesse doesn't work with me in the same organization, right? A sponsor is somebody who's two levels above you, who has the ability to hire, make power moves. They're going to use their skin in the game, open doors, get you meetings with the CEO. That's the difference. And so to me, when I'm sitting in meetings and people are like, let's start a mentorship program, I'm like, no. Mentors are amazing. There's, there is... No way I would be here today without my community of mentors. But sponsors are what's going to help you advance your career. And how do you get sponsors? Your sponsor could be your boss's boss. It could be, if you think in a cross-functional matrix organization, if I'm sitting in marketing, it could be the VP of supply chain who's sponsoring me, right? You want to think about who is talking about your career when the doors are closed and who who are in those talent meetings advocating for you other than your boss, because, you know, Dee and I talk about this a lot, you might not have a good relationship with your boss. And so what happens then? I love that. And it gets down to this reality, this somewhat harsh reality. Um, I remember early in my career, when I was still quite young, I was interviewing the CEO of Yahoo, who was then a woman named Carol Bartz, who had a very saucy mouth. And this was a casual event. I think it was a dinner we were at, actually, at Cheryl Sandberg's house. And I, I finally got my time to like talk to her. And I was like, Carol, you know, I'm young in my career. What should I know? And she turned to me and she said, the thing you should know is that no one cares about your career but you and your mom and your mom's just being nice. Oh, And it was so rude, right? Um, But there was a truth in that that Uh. was so important to hear, which is that you are the primary driver of what happens to you in an organization. No one behind a closed door is talking about you except if you can create a sponsor relationship. And then you know that you Mm -hmm. have somebody who is acting on your behalf. Now, we hope that this sort of just happens. That's like there's this osmosis around it. Like, oh, somebody notices me. It's all reactive, mind you. Somebody mm-hmm. notices me. They like me. I've impressed them. They they look out for me. But in truth, we actually would do well to cement the deal, to understand, to articulate that relationship. How do we do that? Here's the thing. It's not like the the best friend necklaces back in junior high where you're going to give someone like half the necklace and be like, be my sponsor. I, that's not how it works, right? <laughs> but it is, in at least in my view. For me, I've always thought about where am I sitting in the organization? Who are the people that are two levels above me that are not my boss and boss's boss? And how are the projects and work that I am doing of value to them? Because once yeah. people see value in what you're doing, listen, everyone wants credit, right? Everyone yeah. wants credit. And they also, like, for somebody who's a leader, when you're at that level, you're directing. You're not doing. And you want the best people around you directing. And they also want to want to be like, oh, yeah, I know that project Mina's working on. I'm actually involved in it, right? Yeah. And so for them as well, it shows that they're a talent leader and that they're developing the next generation of talent. Well, I also think about that piece around how you can create value for that person as the single most important piece, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's really easy to say yes to someone when whatever they're proposing is going to make you look good to the people above you. Absolutely. Right? And so the how you do that is, I go back to my, I'm in marketing, D is the VP of supply chain. I have a project I'm working on. It's like a restage of a brand. Supply chain is going to be all over that. I set up a meeting with Dee to say, hey, here are my thoughts. I'm working on this initiative. I'd love your perspective and advice on this proposal. Dee's going to sit there. She's going to listen and she's going to start to give her own ideas. And then Dee's going to say to me, you know what? 
Why don't you come back to me in two weeks? Or why don't we start meeting once a month? Because I'd love to be involved in this project because this person's all of a sudden, oh, this is in my lane now too. Like this is about supply chain. Like I need to be involved in this, right? And so that's how you start to, as the protege, you start to develop this relationship without me going up to D and be like, D, will you be my sponsor? And D's like, I don't even know you. Why am I going to sponsor you? <laughs> like, right? Yep. And can I jump in? That, that conversation, different from a mentor conversation that is more exploratory and career focused versus that conversation with the sponsor is value add work focused and impact focused. That's the distinction. So, so similar thing, if you're going to a mentor, um, you have, it is, it might be an internal mentor, you have aspirations to follow a similar path or even let's just say work in that particular business unit. So one of the ways to have a conversation, hey, uh, you know, admire, appreciate, respect and value, you know, your career, the work that you do here, uh, would you be willing to give 15 minutes for um, an exploratory? I'm sorting through my next moves. I'm sorting through long-term where I can add value. I wanted to add, I was just talking to an executive yesterday and I do this often with execs. So the flip of what we're saying is also true. I, as the protege, I'm looking in the organization, trying to think, who can I build a relationship with who will be a sponsor? All the execs, anyone who's sitting on a leadership team right now, ask yourself who you're sponsoring. Are there two individuals in your organization that you are sponsoring who don't look like you, act like you, or think like you? Because that is the gap of what we talk about at Brown Table Talk as well. So if you have predominantly an executive team of white men, the question is, who are those white men proactively sponsoring? It's a great question. And I would I would say that it's a question that doesn't just apply to executives, that no, anywhere we sit in no. the middle of our yes. organizations, we can look down the ladder a couple of rungs and evaluate the kinds of relationships we have with with that category Absolutely. of people. And I'll just add to that. I think that's the new rules. Like if we're resetting in the most unprecedented time, the new rules for leaders, people leaders today, not just executives, is you have to be able to lead through and from a multicultural lens. It's a season of the worker, right? We are in the season of the great resignation and my co-host here, my friend Mita likes to call the great awakening. And, and so it, it behooves corporations right now to begin to look at leaders' ability to lead from a multicultural mm-hmm. lens because yeah. domestically, right, the largest emerging market domestically is 51% people of color. And so what does that mean for the workplace? What does that mean for leaders, mentors, and sponsors? It means that there is a need right now to really look at um, how it is that you you are increasing your ability or improving your ability to lead all people in the organization. We're going to take a quick break here. When we get back, we'll get some advice from Mita and Dee on how to go after what you want. And we're back. Mita and Dee refer to the great resignation as the great awakening. And I love that. It's no secret the pandemic has caused many of us to reassess our lives, our goals, and our passions. We're pursuing new interests or careers, and sometimes that means proactively choosing a lateral move, or even moving to a role that would be considered a step down so that you can have the larger life that you want. So I asked me to indeed what advice they had for this situation. There's a piece I had penned for Fast Company after reading this McKinsey study that said the number one reason people are leaving is not for more money, not for swag, not for free pizza or whatever you're offering. It is because they don't feel like they belong. And it is that is so true for individuals of color. They are disproportionately leaving because they don't feel like they belong. And so I, you know, this pent up emotion that people have felt, and certainly I have, of the things that you will tolerate at work, which I will no longer tolerate. So I think there's that piece of people are going to go where I say, you know, go where you are celebrated, not tolerated. It took me too long in my career to realize that. So I think there's that piece as well. And I think there's the piece too of the recognition of many women of color feeling like they're stuck in their careers. Like Dee always says, say no to laterals, which is controversial. We talk about that. But why am I the number two? Why am I constantly being passed up? Why am I not getting promoted? Why do I not have enough points on the board? How many more points do I need? And so I think there's that piece as well, where more people are choosing to say, 
right, of course, for work-life integration, but also says, I'm going to go somewhere where I'm going to get valued and I'm going to be paid. Yeah. And this is right now, as Dee said, it's, it's, an, it's an employee's market right now. Yeah. And I'll just jump in on this, um, you know, idea of taking a lateral or a step down. Um, I say no to laterals, but I'll, I'll give an angle to when you could say yes to a lateral. Uh, yes to a lateral. If if you could just share with me, Mita, let's just say Mita's my boss, the last three scenarios or laterals in the organization. And if there is a white cisgender male in the last three, then maybe laterals, that's the culture mm -hmm. of the company. Mm -hmm. But I challenge this idea of laterals and a step down. It sounds like that's probably women. It's all it's probably women and it's probably women of color. Right. And so I say, say no to laterals. No laterals are canceled for for people of color at this point because people of color are getting the offer that is a lateral. So I think since we have come over to the um, or since the diversity tipping point, which is the period beginning May 29th of 2020, when uh, corporate America, for the very first time, uh, publicly acknowledged that Black Lives, air quotes, hello Monday, uh, air quotes, uh, do matter, uh, laterals were canceled, right? Because we moved into DNI 3.0, which was prioritizing race and culture um, over DNI 2.0, which was uh, gender was prioritized as a result of hashtag me too, right? And so from that, laterals are canceled for people of color um, unless it is the culture of that company that, yep, mm -hmm. there's equal opportunity laterals. And so, but here's another case study, you know, had this conversation with a senior executive, small company, he's chief diversity officer, and, and he negotiated um, differently. Uh, you know, he just wanted to work from home, right? But, but he's a male, right? Man versus right. woman. He just, he didn't take a lateral, he renegotiated. And so Hello Monday, renegotiate. Renegotiate mm -hmm. for more money, more benefits, and I'm going to stay home with my kids, okay? So listen, this is your market. So th that's my my two cents. Laterals are canceled unless it's part of the culture. And just renegotiate boldly and unapologetically. And if I didn't say this, uh, women, ladies, I'm sorry, are y'all asking for more money always, every time, first, ev all the time, okay? <laughs> every time, always, always, always. always and hello day. Monday, guys, right? We need you all to share, okay, when you are negotiating, what we just need some insight. What's your conversation, right? Because oh, yes. we get great perspective there. So I'll stop talking there, but that's my two cents. I love that. I love that. This idea of you can have it all. Yeah. Don't step aside. Just ask for exactly what you want. Yeah. Now's the time. Now is the time. You succinctly pointed out the fact that we have moved into, uh, you call it the 3.0 era around DNI. and i um, I want to question that, right? So we are almost two years after May 2020. A lot of things have changed. A lot of things have not changed. And it's unclear to me whether there's the momentum in corporate America to keep up the kind of um, panicked awakening that we experienced in the summer of 2020 as everybody rushed to figure out whether they were doing enough to be, you know, woke corporate employers. I think there are there are some bright spots that we're seeing in the marketplace. I also think, as Dee and I talk about, as, as we've coined the word diversity dressing, there's a rush to check all these boxes and pretend that you're doing the work, right? So diversity dressing is I'm on my phone, on Instagram. I'm a big beauty person. I see a beauty brand unnamed, beautiful image of a black woman with like stunning makeup. So I see that and I'm like, oh, that makeup's going to work on my skin. Let me go look up that blush and eyeshadow. Oh, oops, they don't sell it. Oops, they don't sell it. Diversity dressing. They just put the image out there. And Dee talks about this too with I'm not a stock photo. Right. And also the fact that like you might be misrepresenting what what your diversity of representation is inside your workforce versus the images and the external sort of face that you have. And listen, I'm like, I think that's a, that's an important question to ask for anyone who's listening. Like once I was get the offer and ask all your questions, what is your diversity of representation like? And depending where I'm at, where I am, I'm always honest with people. I'm like, hey, we're on a journey. We're early here, but this is why we need you, right? And so people aren't surprised. Yeah. 
I hear that. When they show up. Just to add to that. um, So, you know, if you think about corporate America today, we're talking about institutions that are 100 years old. And so if they are 100 or even 50, 60, 70 years to become who they are today, then it's certainly not going to take a year or two years to undo what has already been done in terms of systemic racism, right, in the workplace. To be quite honest, um, it's going to be a slow journey. I don't think there's there's any going backwards. It's going to continue to yes. move forward. I'm going to tell you why. Because we live in a highly digital social world, there is high reputational risk. Whenever there's a flag on the field inside of corporate America, you know, it's going to it's gonna show up in the public domain and people are going to talk about it. Listen, we're getting close to the end of our time here and you guys are so awesome with the takeaways. Come up with one solid piece of career advice you would offer right now. I'm going to go with what we talked about earlier, which is really simple. Ask yourself, who are you sponsoring today? Who are you sponsoring today? And are you sponsoring people? Are we self-segregating? Let's just be clear. Are, are my sponsoring people who look like me, act like me, and think like me? And what would, I, what would that look like if I went into work tomorrow? How would I act differently? And I think it does matter. Jesse, I agree with you. It matters at all levels but it matters at the C-suite level. It matters at the leadership team level. Yeah. Because I can promise you if more women of color would be sponsored, the stats wouldn't be where they are. Whether it's leadership, exec, boardroom, it yeah. would just we would be in a different place. Thank you, Mita. How about you, Dee? Yeah, you know, I think I'm going to go really broad here because I think my one piece of advice addresses so many other issues and and the ROI is big. And that is Everybody needs uh, a personal development plan, a professional mm-hmm. development plan. There should be three things that you are working on in areas that you could become better. Yeah. And I think a lot, a lot of people are missing the investment of time, energy, and resources in becoming better. That was Mita Malik and Dee Marshall. They're the hosts of Brown Table Talk. And Brown Table Talk is part of the new LinkedIn Podcast Network. You can find them on LinkedIn or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And this week on Office Hours, we're going to talk about career advice. Come with questions for other members of our community or come with advice to share. Join us for Office Hours on Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll talk strategy, helpful tips, what scares us. We're a community and we're here to help push through it. You can find us on the LinkedIn news page or email us for a link at hellomonday at linkedin.com. And as always, if you like the show, please rate and review us. It helps us so much. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Taisha Henry with help from Wesley Wingo. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Ariando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor are part of the Great Awakening. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. And Sarah Storm remains forever our fairy godmother. I'm Jesse Hempel. We're back next Monday. Thanks for listening. Jesse, are you going to be hosting like a party or something this year for the LinkedIn Podcast Network? Um, Launch party? Ooh, that's an interesting idea. D&I, yeah, mm-hmm. I was like, yes, oh, see, in the yes. world, I was like, Yes, launch party at LinkedIn. Hmm? Just thinking.